Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of A A BJJ BJJ Marriage, Marriage, where we talk about our lives as a married jujitsu couple. <laughs> Look at us. Yeah, we're doing back. We're yes. doing it. It's been a while. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. Episode 83 with your hosts, Nick and Brittany Lee. Yes. We realize it has been a very long time. Our last episode, episode 82, was about my competition, which was a very long time ago. Wow. <laughs> time kind of flies. Yeah. When you're having fun doing jujitsu. Yeah, we've been training a lot. Yes. Just because we haven't been talking about it publicly does not mean that we have not been training have we only gone to one seminar in that time i don't know we've done a lot so it was the camp in between that time i know we were on a cruise so let's see the last tournament was on february 11th so then that would mean february 12th is when we did our uh last episode and then it was the camp yes. so we said we yep. were missing that weekend and, and then, then, we then the next vacation. two sundays we were gone on vacation so we didn't get to do that. And then we didn't two... do a ship episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, we thought about it. But then two Sundays ago, I had a women's only open mat. So we just, and it was daylight savings time. So we kind of just <laughs> ran out of time that day. Sure. And then last week, we just didn't feel like it. Like we just straight up didn't feel like it. So yeah. We slept in a little bit. I'm making excuses, but we're here. We're back now. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> episode 83. So rocking and rolling. Yeah. So we did. One we had two uh, one seminar and one camp in between that time. Mm-hmm. And so we've learned a lot of jujitsu since our last episode. In a nine day vacation. And then, <laughs> yep. We also did jujitsu on the ship. Yeah, yeah, we did. Oh my gosh! Wow, it feels like forever ago. It kind of was forever. Time flies, like I said. Yeah. So let's back it up. Let's go to the Gentle Art Lifestyle Camp. The it was in February. It's yep. Wow! Wow! <laughs> it's always in February. Uh, he does one at Labor Day. Josh Janice does a Gentle Hut Lifestyle Camp during Labor Day. And then also a February Winter Camp as well. So, this last one, we got Did you just to say... Win. Wait, what, what did you just say? Did you say a winter camp and a winter camp? <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> I meant a Memorial Day camp and a February Winter Camp. When's Memorial Day? Labor Day. Wow. I need more coffee. <laughs> Wait a second. Labor Day. Labor Day in September. Okay. A fall camp and a winter camp. There we go. Is That's that what you're easier. trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> I was listening and I was like, wait a second. So was everyone else and they were like, wait, what? <laughs> but so we had winter camp. Winter camp in February. Not Memorial Day. <laughs> oh, geez. And it was at White Lotus in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we got to learn from a bunch of different people this time, actually. Yes. It was black belts from all over the country, which was really cool. Yes. Um, mostly Arizona. <laughs> not mostly. I mean, Rich is from Jersey. Yeah, he doesn't count. What? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we love Rich Sab. If you yeah. are interested in ever learning some really cool lapel stuff, go check out Rich Sab on uh, Fugitive Fanatics. Yeah, it's okay. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> he's very cool. <laughs> he's good stuff. <clears throat> so, yeah, we learned some lapel attacks from Rich Saab, and we learned from Jay Pages. Mm-hmm. From, he's from Arizona. Yep. We learned a cool sequence into a different type of ankle lock. Yeah, he which did was some really fun. K guard stuff, too. Yeah, it was like a mixture of X and K guard transitioning, mm-hmm. falling into a Kyotera ankle lock. For short-legged leprechauns like us. For those of you who don't know what that is, don't feel bad. I don't either. And I was there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. And then we learned chain passing from... Samantha Courier. She actually just got her black belt within the last year. And she's also from Arizona. And she came all the way out to Wisconsin in the bitter cold from her Arizona heat to come teach us some really cool chain passing. Mm-hmm. And actually, she taught me... The one thing that I remember the most from the entire camp that I've been using almost every time I roll since, which is really nice. cool. Does it work on me? Mm, it's not kidding. working a lot of the times yet, but it's getting there. Yeah. It's getting better. I'm good. noticing what I'm doing. That's good. That's how it works. And I did teach it as well at our lab class on a Tuesday recently. 
basically, what you're on. yeah, basically what it is, and it's kind of hard to describe without looking at it. But when you are in a when you're in someone's guard and they have a knee shield on you, basically instead of weaving your arm between their legs and trying to like smash past that way. You're going to take your arm and you're going to go underneath both of the legs and use your chest to compress their legs together while yep. holding it, kind of like Pin mermaid. the knees together. Yeah, you're going to mermaid them together, but you still have to worry about that foot on your hip when you have that knee shield on. The hook. Yeah, so you have to Watch scroll. out for them dirty hookers, <laughs> like me. Dirty feet on your gi, you don't want that. And that's just how I would say. But yeah, so you have to get rid of that hook. So after you have both of the arm or the legs pinned with your arm, then you sprawl back so that you can straighten out the legs and then you just start walking around. And you can go either way. There's yep. options for both people on both sides. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's been working really well for some people. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I've been figuring it out. Yeah. that I think that that class, that seminar that we're talking about, Samantha's seminar, well, it's very helpful for me also because it put together, it solidified the fact that there's no real like technique that's going to pass any one certain person's guard. Mm-hmm. It's all about, you have to combine different concepts of guard passing mm-hmm. and put them together in a way that's going to deconstruct your opponent's guard mm-hmm. to get through it. So that way, through it or around it or over it or under it. <laughs> so that way you disrupt what they're trying to do in their guard and you can make what you want to happen, happen. Basically, the way she started her seminar, I think about this almost on a daily basis. It's just, I just love her personality and the way that she explained things. Like she was just so fun and lighthearted, and like you could just tell that she was a goofy personality outside of the gym. And the way she started her seminar was she was like, "So I don't know if you guys have realized, but like people are really fucking good at jujitsu." <laughs> 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 and yeah. just the way she said it, I was like, yeah, they really are. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Profound. <laughs> so you could just tell that kind of set the tone of the whole day. And she just did a really good job explaining things and going through it. And she's about my size. Like, she's probably like a 140, 150 black belt female. And she, I mean, as a black belt, she's been around for a while. She's been doing it for a long time. She's seen a lot of different ways and how the culture is kind of adjusted throughout the years and so people used to not be as good as ju- at jujitsu as they are now 20 years ago because yeah. they didn't have the resources to study it the way we've that talked we about now. that yeah the sport is evolving yes so just the way she said it was really funny and i just really liked her whole mentality on it of just you're not going to beat everyone with the same move you got to figure out a move that works for you and how to adjust it to everyone that you're working with is basically how she went along and she didn't really teach us a whole lot of new things. She just taught, like, more mindset and changing your perspective on who you're rolling with. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. it was cool. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. Yeah. And you guys did Lake Michigan? Yeah, and Josh Janice taught a bunch of stuff, too. Yeah, he taught some cool stuff. He was another black belt there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like we take that for granted. Yeah. That's uh, just Josh. It's just Josh. <laughs> He's just joshing around. <laughs> Painless, precise jujitsu. Mm, yeah. Playful, painless, and precise jujitsu. Yes. Yeah. That's what he says. Except he tricked me. Every time I roll with him, he always likes to tell me, he's like, hey, you should like put your hand here instead of where you're at. And I'm like, okay. And then he sweeps me or submits me with it. And I'm like, that's a dick move. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know why you listen to me. I'm like, because you're a black belt. Of course I'm going to listen to you. You're telling, I thought you were telling me to do something better, not worse. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I feel like it validates me just a little bit, though, because then it's just like, oh, well, I was doing the right thing, and you tricked me, and you made me think I was doing the wrong thing, so you're just a jerk. I think he's playing. Yeah. He's keeping it playful, you know. Mm-hmm. He doesn't talk to me when we roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. uh, <laughs> there might be a difference. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, though. <laughs> uh Yes. But yeah, camp was super fun. Outside of learning a bunch of jiu-jitsu, we went to the lake a couple times, built a fire on the beach, which I'm pretty sure is illegal, so please don't send us to the police. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Anyways, yeah, that was super fun. I love going in the cold water and then coming to dry off next to a nice hot fire. Yeah. That's always super fun. I didn't go in, but yeah, the fire was nice. (laughs) Yeah, the fire was nice. And... It was. It's always fun going to jiu-jitsu camps to meet a bunch of new people. We met a bunch of new people. 
Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. We had a game night and oh, that, that was, was so much fun. This was at the gym. So we had the seminar all day. We went to the lake. Everybody went to get dinner. We came back and we had a game night with everybody at camp. And um, somebody had mentioned magic cards, Magic the Gathering. And I have a bunch of Magic the Gathering cards in my basement. It's right over there. And I brought a bunch and we had a good time playing Magic the Gathering. I never thought I'd be playing Magic the Gathering at a jiu-jitsu camp. And here we are. It happened. It was a dream come true. <laughs> it was a very good time. No, it was a really great night. I really loved the game night because it was just a good bonding experience for all of us. She didn't play Magic. No. And I played What Do You Mean, though. And I was playing with some people who had uh, been a little under the influence. <laughs> and when yep. you're playing What Do You Mean, it's already a hilarious game, but it's even more funny when they can't stop laughing. Yep. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Drugs. <Yes. laughs> wow. Jesus. Yeah, please do not no. send this to the police. It was so it's funny. A bad though. podcast. People were just dying laughing. It was so. <laughs> it was awesome. Drugs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So anyway. <laughs> Oh, we went sledding, too. We did go sledding. Yeah, we went snow tubing at, it's called The Rock here in Milwaukee. And it's just a really cool area where they have snowboarding and skiing, but then off to the other side of the, is it a park? It's a complex. Yeah, a complex, sure. (laughs) (laughs) But they have snow tubing as well, which was super cool. So we went as a giant group. And actually, the employees told us that it was the largest group that they had ever seen together at one time. And we're like... Because we're yep. awesome. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we learned a bunch of cool jiu-jitsu there. Mm-hmm. Um, then we went on a cruise. We did. We went to the Caribbean. We rested our bodies for like a whole nine days. Yeah. And I was all excited because I was like, ooh, maybe like my knees will heal. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> nine days was not enough. Mm. But, oh well. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we got some really good rest and relaxation for our bodies. Yeah. It was a nice change of pace for us because we're so used to going, going, going that it was really nice to just lay down and not have to be anywhere. We did think about rolling. We tried to roll, but there was really nowhere to roll. So for anyone who has ever been... We did roll. We rolled once. (laughs) Anyone who's ever been on a cruise, you know how small your rooms are. It's called the stateroom. And it's really just like a bathroom that's maybe, I don't know, four feet big. and. Oh, like four square feet? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then you have a room that has a bed, a closet, and a little mini couch. And that's it. That's your whole room. So you don't have, like, anywhere really to move. (laughs) No room for activities. No. And so we were just like, okay, well, we can't roll in the stateroom. So we went to the gym that they have on the ship, and we did find some mats that they had. But they were, like... Just yoga mats. Yeah. They didn't seem great for rolling, so we did not do that either. But we did roll on the top deck a little bit. Nick actually did some uh, solo drills. Yeah. Yeah, Some solo drills with the water in the background that I'm sure he's really eager to post about. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. (laughs) Some of this. We didn't post about our trip at all, actually. (laughs) And... Yeah, so we were on the top deck with the water and the sun, and we just rolled around a little bit. But it's like, kind of like it's not concrete. It's almost like um like a playground, like or like an at a gym, yeah, where it's like solid but almost a little rubbery, yeah, but not like slippery or rough. Yeah, it's really somewhere hard. in between. Yep. <laughs> so we rolled on that, and it was just very uncomfortable. I didn't really enjoy it quite like at all. Well, that's because you were on bottom. And I'm on a dress. I was wearing my sundress. <laughs> Maybe you should learn how to get on top. <laughs> I was wearing a sundress. <laughs> and we were rolling around, and there's this group of girls, probably like, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, and they walked past us, and they were like, get him, girl! And they are just walking. <laughs> that was entertaining. Yeah, it was a and good time. I could definitely see eyes staring at us from, like, all over the ship. But That's fine. <laughs> They were wondering if there was a problem or not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think they were wondering if I was actually being attacked or not. Yeah. (laughs) It's probably pretty terrifying for people who don't know what's going on. And then you're sitting on the top deck of a 17-story ship. 
And then, and then you see us trading leg lock positions. <laughs> and you're like, that doesn't look like a bad thing, but also it looks very weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. we did say that we should work on board of a cruise ship and teach you to do and self-defense classes, because that would be an awesome job. Yes. I wonder how many people would come. I think so. self-defense classes would build a lot. I think a lot of women would read that and they would actually show up. Maybe. Out of the 6,000 people on the ship? Mm-hmm. People showed up for napkin decorating, so I'm pretty sure they show up <laughs> for self-defense. <laughs> Weirdos. <laughs> They're looking for anything to do on the cruise ship. Right. Yeah. But, so yeah, that was our trip. And so we left on a Saturday. So that took up the next Sunday while we were getting ready to board. And then the following Sunday when we were coming home. So that was now two more Sundays. And then the Sunday after that was a women's only open mat at a gym in Milwaukee called Crossover. And that was... I didn't get to go. No. Sorry. <laughs> That's fun. That's just part of our uh, monthly rotating women's open mat that we have at a different gym every month. So last month was at Crossover. This coming month, which is actually a week from today, April 2nd, it's going to be at Nova in Oak Creek. So if you're in the Milwaukee area or somewhere around there and you feel like making a drive, like sweeps ladies, they like to drive three hours for these, which I love. I love seeing them. It's fantastic. I just love the dedication because they literally drive three hours once a month for these things. But, uh, so yeah, it'll be at Nova in Oak Creek if you are a lady and would like to show up. I would like to. They don't care what I identify as a lady and try to show up. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then last week we went to a seminar for Chris Paynes. Was that last week? Yeah, it was last week, Thursday. Holy cow. A week and a half ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was an awesome seminar. Mm -hmm. Chris had some really solid jiu-jitsu. And it was pretty cool because um, it was a weekday, so there was regular class before the seminar, and he actually came and taught some leg locks during our regular class time. And he put me in this leg entanglement with the strongest bite on my hip and femur that I've ever felt in my life. Mm-hmm. And he he was demonstrating. He was like, can I borrow you? And I was like, sure. And then he looked at me and he said, don't scream. And I was like... <laughs> Okay. He was like, I'm not going to heel hook you. Don't scream. He said that twice. And I was like, okay, well, we'll see what happens here. And then he put the leg entanglement on me, which was, it's hard to describe, but I had to show you. So please come see me and I'll show you how it feels like. (laughs) But I thought my uh, femur was going to break in half and I didn't react or anything. And I didn't know if my leg was going to break in half, but I trusted him. (laughs) Thankfully, my leg did not break in half. (laughs) But I felt it for, like, a whole day, just him clamping on my leg once. And then he, I didn't scream, so then he did it to someone else, and everybody else he did it to was like, ah, ah, and screamed, (laughs) and tapped, just from the leg hold. (laughs) (laughs) But I was determined to not scream for some reason, probably to my detriment. But he taught some leg locks, and um, a lot about controlling the, the upper joint, the joint closer to the middle of the body. And then working your way towards the breaking mechanisms and the other grips that you need to get to for any submission, not just leg locks. And that was cool to see. And then Brittany showed up by the time for the seminar. And we learned a lot of... (laughs) We learned a lot of mindset stuff. Yeah, concepts. Yeah, he even said at the end of the two-hour seminar, he's like, I didn't teach you anything new today. You knew everything that I already showed you. I just taught you how to look at it differently. And I remember his seminar started by him saying, I'm going to change the way that you roll completely for the rest of your lives. And I was like, yeah, okay, good luck. (laughs) And he was like, by the end of this two-hour seminar, you're going to look and feel different. And I was like, what does that even mean? And I totally didn't believe him. I'm like, no, I'm totally set. Like, where I'm at, I'm good with where I'm going. I'm I'm a blue belt. (laughs) I know (laughs) jujitsu. But I was like, there's no way this dude is going to completely change my mindset on jujitsu in two hours. Like, there's just no way. Like, yeah, he'll teach me new things that I'll probably take away from it, just like I do every seminar. But I was like, no way. And, uh, yeah, go to a Chris Payne seminar. He'll change the way that you <laughs> think about jujitsu for the rest of your life. Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, he showed, he talked about how when we're rolling in the gym, especially 
if people are preparing for competition. Somebody will hit a sweep, and you, if, as a guard passer or something, if you know that it was a good sweep, a lot of times you'll accept the sweep and then start working bottom position. Mm -hmm. But the main takeaway from that is... No, if you have the chance to get up, like once your hip hits the ground, you still have that chance to bounce up and at least get to a knee and start building back up or getting to turtle or working up to getting back to standing or guard passing. But there's a lot of times where we will accept going to the bottom position where we really could have fought much harder to not get on the bottom position. Because in any competition setting, we're giving up points. In MMA, if you're on the bottom, you're more than likely it's harder to work on the bottom than it is to work in top position. And it's striked and elbowed and everything from right. the bottom. And in self-defense, the bottom is the worst place to be just in general. Most of the times, whenever you have to defend yourself, you're not going to be on mats either. So why would you ever want to be on your back on a concrete? Yeah, yeah exactly. That terrible. I mean, we did it on <laughs> rubber concrete, and that was very uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. And when I teach, like, city champs classes, a lot of it is self-defense for the kids. And we, I, I will demonstrate a technique and I'll tell them about, you don't want your head to touch the mat ever. You don't want to be on the ground ever because this is a mat when we're playing around and it can feel okay. But like, imagine if this was concrete and you did a forward roll and you led with your forehead. How would that feel? <laughs> and then they're always like, ow. <laughs> uh, I don't think that would feel good. No. <laughs> and it's like, no, don't let your head touch the ground ever. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so something that I took away from that, because I play on my back quite a lot, just because it's jujitsu and you have a guard, and that's kind of what we're taught from your first day at class, is how to use your guard effectively. Yes, and let's be fair, you're a smaller body type than most people you grapple against. Yes, so I feel, I wouldn't even say comfortable on my back, because obviously people can pass my guard, but like, I for lack of a better word, do feel comfortable on my back. And comfortable also, and safe. Yes. And also because I have terrible knees. Like, I cannot put pressure on my knees very much at all before they give out. So I play a lot on my back. And I play, if I do get on top, it's typically not both knees on the ground at once. Like, if I'm in turtle, I have to pay attention to where I'm putting my weight on my knees. And if I'm in mount, I only have one knee on the ground. And it's just, like, my knees are terrible. So back is very comfortable for me. So when he was going over all of this and saying, like, you shouldn't be on your back. Back is stupid. Guard is stupid. You shouldn't do this. And I was like, I hate you. Like, <laughs> I was like, no, guard Who is... are you to say that? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, screw you. It's <laughs> like, I love guard. What are you talking about? And the way that he got into, like, got it through to me, though, is as someone who is a guard player, who loves playing guard and can't be on my knees, the way that he got through to me was by saying and comparing it to every single thing ever before jujitsu. So like Nick was saying, in any self-defense scenario, if you're on your back, it's terrible. In any MMA situation, if you're on your back, it's probably not good for you. And the other thing too is like when you're going back to old times, like maybe with wrestling or with any other type of martial art. Like, you mean throughout humankind? Yes. It You are in trouble if you're on bottom. And yes, jujitsu is created to help get over that fear. And to kind of, like, teach the Give you person. options. Yeah. But, like, he was saying that if someone passes your knee line, whether it's jujitsu or MMA or wrestling or anything, you're in trouble. You're They have now got the upper hand on you. And, yeah, you can start working to defend, but now you have to work much harder. And you can feel really good about keeping them away with your legs. But, again, as soon as they pass your knee line, now you have to completely change everything that you were originally doing. And it's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous spot to play. Jiu-Jitsu is not so dangerous because that's what we do. That's what we play. And that's how we learn. But if you compare it to other sports and other martial arts and other self-defense scenarios, it's not such a good place to be. So yep. that's how he got through to me. I still play guard every day. but <laughs> Yeah. And obviously, yes, you need to work on your guard. Um, he was talking about the Chris Hodder rules of Jiu-Jitsu. Um, and one of them, excuse me. <clears throat> <laughs> you good there? Yeah, I think I'm okay. Uh, one of them, I think it's the second rule, is if you end up in your guard, have a guard that somebody can't pass. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think he, the rules, the Chris Hodder rules are be on top, stay on top. If you have to use your guard, 
don't let your guard be passed. And then there's... So he has, uh, like, his S's, too. Well, that's a different thing, though. Okay. That's yeah. not Chris Potter? That's not Chris Potter. Okay. That was... Chris was just talking... Or Chris Paynes was just talking about that. But, I, shoot. I can't remember Chris Potter's rules, but they are very good. And you should look them up. But even just you saying that, that's nothing new. Like, we're right. taught, get on top, stay on top. If you have a guard, don't let them pass it. And you're mm-hmm. you're taught all of these things. You're taught this day one. The first day you step into the gym, you're taught this stuff. So, like, it's not new material. It's just a new perspective on it. And just to understand, like, yeah, when you're playing jujitsu, I think it's fine to use your guard. But, like, if you really were in a life or death situation, are you really just going to fall on your back? <laughs> yeah, and if and you do, there. you're going to push them away with your legs, do a technical stand-up, and get the fuck out of there. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to take them down then and make them pay. Pretty much. So the way that he made us drill and work and do things with a different perspective is every time your hip hit the floor, get up. Mm-hmm. Even if it was only to your knees, get up and start working for your top position. So don't lay so that your spine is on the ground. Don't lay so your shoulders are on the ground. Your hip hits the ground, you get up and you stand up. Mm-hmm. And then you start working. He went over some, and then when you when you get to standing, he sh- showed some wrestling stuff, and he just showed how to keep them away, how to keep them from attacking a single leg, and things like that. And so, I guess that was a move that he showed with the arm. Mm-hmm. But besides that, like he was basically just saying, like, change your mindset; it'll change your life. And yeah, it was just very. It was very eye opening. That was weird. So I knew you were gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> It was very fun. I enjoyed it a lot. And then he showed a frame that him and Charles Harriet have been working on mm-hmm. a lot. What? I just thought I heard footsteps. Oh. Um, yeah, either the, you can either call it the skeleton frame or the Kindle frame is what he was calling it. Yeah. Yep. Or the Charles Harriet frame. <laughs> yeah, Charles Harriet called it skeleton. Yeah. But he said he gave props to Charles Harriet for it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Chris Paynes, he's also, is he on BJJ Fanatics? Yeah. Okay, so he's on BJJ Fanatics, but he's also a Globetrotters instructor. So if you make it to a Globetrotters camp, there's a good chance you'll see him there. And you'll learn from him. He's an English dude. He has the most viewed Globetrotters seminar on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Like 70,000 views or something. That's insane. Well, I've so, only watched it 20,000 times, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> is he going to be in Estonia? I don't think so. Okay. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I was scrolling through the list the other day on Estonia camp, and there's like 25, 30 black belt coaches. No, yeah, it's crazy. And it's like, oh, okay. That's going to be a wild event. We're going to Globetrotters Estonia in Parnu in July, so we're really looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited for that a lot. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. We're actually <laughs> booking our flights for that next week, two weeks from now. Two weeks. Yeah. But mm-hmm. anyway, so yeah, we have been busy, to say the least. We have been... Constantly training, still going every day that we can, and all that stuff. We have a belt ceremony tomorrow for oh, three wow. of our friends, so yep. that's cool. All getting their blue belts. Yeah, it's a blue belt ceremony. New targets. <laughs> <laughs> so mm-hmm. that'll be fun. And what other events do we have coming up before we die? Rollathon. Yes. So April 22nd, it's a Saturday. We are doing our second annual Rollathon. It will be held at Fluid Jiu Jitsu in Greenfield, Wisconsin. And we are having six black belts teach open mat and then an open mat following after that. So it'll be 12 hours. Yeah. So one hour of instruction, one hour rolling, one hour instruction, one hour rolling for 12 hours. Yep. It'll be really fun. We did it last year and we had about 115 people in throughout the day. Hell Some, yeah. Only 14 of them made it the entire 12 hours, but anyone who... Yours truly included. <laughs> anyone who does make it the full 12 hours will get a patch for free that I actually designed recently, so I'm excited about that. But yeah, uh-huh. anyone who makes it the full 12 hours will get a free patch. It is $120 for the full day, and it's $60 if you just want to do a two-hour. So if you want to do one seminar, one open mat, it's $60. Mm-hmm. But if you want to come to two or more seminars, then it's $120. And it doesn't go up after that. It's just $60 for two hours or $120 for... All day. Come and go as you please. Yeah. And it's supporting NAMI, mm-hmm. N-A-M-I, which stands for National Association of Mental Illness. Yes. So all proceeds minus costs of like food and stuff are going straight to that association, which would mm-hmm. be really cool. 
Yeah, we're going to have tacos. Last I year believe. was close to $5,000, so hopefully this year we can break that. Yeah, that'd be really cool. But, yeah, we are going to have tacos during the day. I th- are we going to use the quesadilla maker? No. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we're going to have a wine bar after at 8 o'clock, and there's going to be tons of rolling. I'd bring a couple of geese if you plan on staying for the whole day. Yeah, I think last time I brought a few rash guards and a few geese, mm-hmm. and I used all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and I had a banana. Kind of nuts. <laughs> if you have dogs, make plans for the day for them to get let out oh, yeah. and fed, because that's what we're going to do. Because last year what I did was Nick stayed all day, but then I ran back and forth from the gym to home twice to go feed the dogs and let them out. But this year I think I'm going to try to get a sitter. Yeah, we know people. <laughs> So, anyway, that is coming up on April 22nd. If you're mm-hmm. interested, you can reach out to either of us or to Brent Fitzgerald directly, and we'll all be able to answer your questions. Mm-hmm. So, it would be super cool. Even yeah. if you're not from Milwaukee, you should still come out for it. Cause I think it it's going to be a great time. It's really cool. And we have... Uh, lots of great jujitsu, lots of great people. Yeah, we have six brand new instructors this year, too, from last year. So, I think we're going to try to do that every year, get different faces in. But last year, it was six completely different black belts than it is this year. Actually, last year, it was 12. There's 12 last year? Oh, that's right, because they did a half hour and a half hour. Yeah. This year we're just doing six. Yes. Okay. But two of the six black belts are actually brand new female black belt instructors. Like, oh, yeah. They just got their black belt within the last three months each. So, Hell yeah. it'll be really cool for Miss Lori LaPaz from Open Guard to teach her lapel attacks. And Miss Joanna Trinidad from Iowa to come in and teach us some tarantula guard. So Yeah, I don't know what that means yet, so Yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. So she's always been good at spider guard. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was a white belt, she was a purple belt, and we were rolling and I was learning jujitsu at this time. And I was in her clothes guard and then she put me in a body triangle from clothes guard and it was like painful and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> And as she was just holding me in that triangle, she was like, Nick, it's okay to tap to the body triangle. And then I was like, I couldn't figure out what to do. And then I was like, okay, tap. And then she was like, Brett, he just tapped to a body triangle. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, God, no, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I learned that she was just giving me shit. Kind of like Josh is to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was not supposed to happen. <laughs> and then yeah so here we are yeah so april 22nd second annual rollathon we'll do it probably every year in april from here going forward it'll be really fun yeah <laughs> and also um after the cruise we helped a couple kids get ready for a fight yesterday mm-hmm. and they had there was a novice mma event that they both fought at which was really fun for them we were getting them prepared. We had lots of training. We actually had three kids, but one of them couldn't come through to fight. But yeah, yesterday we were in the locker rooms with them, warming them up, cornering them at the Waukesha Expo Center. And our first kid, Marco, went out to fight and he won by first round guillotine. And then after that, our other kid, Leo, went out to fight and he won by first round armbar. So we got to showcase some of our youth fluid jujitsu out in novice MMA fights. This last weekend, which was really super fun. And we had a really good time with the kids. Yeah. They're so good, too. They had such good heart. And they were fighting so well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, like, emotional almost because of how good they did. And we just love watching them go out there and do their thing. And just, I mean, not only, like, promoting fluid and everything, but just, like, being the good little humans that they are. And how much, like you said, heart that they put into it. And mm-hmm. the skill that they showed. And it was just... Like I said, it was almost emotional how cool it was. Yeah. So I really like them. Yeah, they're awesome kids. We love them. <laughs> and it was really cool because this, the Marco, the one who got the guillotine in the first round, this is probably the, I don't know, <laughs> eighth or tenth guillotine he's gotten in competition now. More than that. <laughs> More There's than one that. One day that he had eight turn or eight competitions and he won seven of them with guillotines. So eight matches in one competition. Yep. <laughs> I was like, Once, wow, what a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, he just finished them all, some on the ground, some standing, a bunch of guillotine. Mm-hmm. And it was really funny because leading up to this novice MMA fight, some of the rules for the kids were no standing guillotines, no neck cranks, and all guillotines, 
if they were applied, had to be on the ground with an arm in. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I had told Marco over and over, like, no neck cranks. Don't go for head throws like you always do. (laughs) No guillotines, okay? Just, like, do other things. Don't just guillotine people. Also, you're wearing gloves. It's much harder to guillotine people with gloves on. So what does he do? He goes and guillotines again. So so what happened was, during the fight, um, the other kid was pinning Marco up against the cage and then leaned over to work to grab his hips. And he literally just stuck his neck out for a guillotine. And then Marco Emidio was just like, oh, look, a guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> and then fell back with and it and went to And then he went to the ground and ended up finishing the guillotine. And it was like, oh, my God, look at this kid again going for the guillotine. <laughs> but it was, like, the best opportunity for him to go for a guillotine. So, like, he can't even be really that mad. <laughs> and he followed the rules that I told him over and over. Got to keep an arm in. Got to go to the ground. And he literally did that exactly in that sequence. <laughs> He was like, guillotine? Where's the arm? There's the arm. Okay, take him down. Okay. Now I'm on. Okay, guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> it was like textbook. Yeah. Yes. And then it was really cool because we were at dinner afterwards for the fight. And I was like, Marco, where the hell did you learn to just guillotine everybody? And he was like, it was in a private lesson with you. And I was like, well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even hear okay, him say then. that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's what he said. He was like, I don't remember. Yeah, you taught me that in our private lesson. <laughs> I was like, Jesus. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> You're the culprit. I was like, I can't even get Dean that well. That's funny. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> We've been kind of talking for a while just about recap stuff, kind of catching up on a month and a half worth of stuff. But Marco is actually kind of the reason that we did the topic that we wanted to talk about today. Mm-hmm. Because at dinner yesterday, when after the fight, we were talking and I was sitting down with him and then our other kid, Alex, and they're both young. I think Marco's 11 and Alex is 13. So, like, they're both children. Mm-hmm. And... About 100 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> small, small yeah. children. They're tiny, but they're so good. Like, they're going to be so much trouble to so many people when they hit, like, 16, oh my God. 17, 18, like. Fluid's in trouble when they hit that age. They're already so strong. Yeah. They get an arm around your neck and you're like, oh my God. And the Marco just guillotines you and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> you see stars. Yeah. <laughs> so I was talking to the kids and we were talking about the belt system. Also, the server thought you were their mom. That was yeah. pretty funny. Yeah. I don't know why that's a thing. <laughs> also, she thought I was from Jersey Shore. Yeah. She... <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so... We were talking about the belt system, and we were just explaining how long it takes to get stripes on a black belt. And I just explained how it takes three years to get your first stripe, three years to get your second stripe, and three years to get your third stripe. And they were just mind-boggled by this. They could not comprehend that it takes yeah. three years to get a stripe. Because normally, <laughs> as a kid, like you get a stripe in three months. <laughs> like three weeks. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Show up to enough classes, and get a stripe. The little, little kids are actually going to start getting red stripes. Oh. On the other side of their belt until they're ready for their first stripe. Okay. Just to keep them motivated. Yep. Because they suck. Yeah. (laughs) But they're showing up and trying. Right. But they literally don't understand English or something. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, we were going over Use your hips. What hips? And then they were asking (laughs) questions about how long it takes to get your red belt and your core belt and all that stuff. So, we were just going through the time lapse of everything. And they, being 11 and 13 years old, just could not comprehend that it takes 40 years of being a black belt before you're another color. Like, they just did not get that. And Well, they're only 12. Yeah. And so, Marco... Imagine if you've been alive for four of your lives and were a black belt the whole time. What? That's what you'd have to say to them, for them to understand 40 years. Yeah, times yourself by four. Yeah, imagine your whole (laughs) life by four times. Yeah. And you were a black belt the whole time. Well, then Marco did the math. And he's like, well, I can be a 25-year-old black belt. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you could be, as long as you keep up with it. And then he goes, he said, like, the most inspirational thing I think I've ever heard from a child before. But Marco just said to me, and he goes, but why is it about the cloth around your waist? Like, why does it matter so much about the cloth around your waist? Doesn't it just matter about, like, showing up and getting better? And I was like, who? are you like you just went from 11 to like 65 (laughs) in one sentence yes and so then that carried on for the rest of our conversation 
And we were just talking about how jujitsu is not about the belt that you're wearing. It's not about the promotions. It's not about trying to get to black belt. It is about trying to better yourself as a human. It's trying to put your ego in check. It's teaching you how to win. It's teaching you how to lose. It's teaching you how to build confidence. It's just teaching you how to be better overall and how to handle stress and conflict in your life better and just all of these things. And they were just like, yeah, like it's gotten so much easier and blah, 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 blah. Because I told them too, I was like, okay, imagine you're a yellow belt and you've experienced this going in competition. I'm like, as a yellow belt, you're going against another yellow belt. And sometimes you're way, way better than them. And sometimes they're way, way better than you. Because mm-hmm. there's only so many belts for all the different types of body types and all the different types of skill levels that you have. And so it's not, it doesn't come down to the belt. It does come down to you individually. And how much you put into training. Yep. And how so, well you learn. And how well you retain things. Yeah. And so I just told them, I was like, you guys are bettering yourselves every day by showing up. And it doesn't matter what color cloth you're wearing around your waist. As mm-hmm. long as you keep showing up and trying to be a better version of yourself, you will succeed. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, I didn't feel like I was talking to an 11 and a 13 year old. Yeah. They're great kids. I was really sad when that conversation ended because Surgeon was just like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to leave. Yeah. Marco's dad was, he was over it. He was done for the day. <laughs> he was like, it's time to go home now. <laughs> yeah. I think they went to like Sky Zone or something. No, Marco wanted to go to Sky Zone. Oh. And he was told no. Oh, okay. <laughs> he just got done fighting out of the cage and he wanted to go jump on a trampoline. He, he fought for a minute. <laughs> come on yeah i would have so much energy mm-hmm. if i was ready for a fight and i fought for a minute <laughs> i'd be ready to rage yeah <laughs> so we didn't, just... yeah for the whole we had two fighters we didn't even have to do a in between rounds like we didn't have to break in between rounds it was just fight win fight win okay i'm going home yeah time to eat <laughs> Yes. We ended up going back and watching more fights, actually, because mm-hmm. we felt like we didn't get to watch enough fighting. Yeah. <laughs> Three minutes of yeah. fighting total. Three minutes. <laughs> and they used to use jujitsu and MMA. Yep. Good for them, I guess. So I've had that conversation about the belt system with many people before. Like, I try to explain that a lot to the white belt females, and I try to explain that a lot to people that may not know jujitsu and just explain to them more about what it is on a deeper level and... Like, I've had that specific conversation a lot before, but mm-hmm. I've never had it with a kid. And it was very, like, inspiring for me, I think, to see them so interested and, in, like, actually understanding and having this conversation with me. Because it was, like, you, okay, so when you are talking to a child, and granted, Alex and Marco are a little bit older, so it's easier to have conversations with them. But when you're talking to a five-year-old, you have to explain everything. You have to say every single word with the exact intention that you mean it. And you can't... <laughs> you mean they're literal and they can't read between the lines? <laughs> right. So, like, you have to be very black and white. Like when you're trying to tell me how to cook <clears throat> something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, like, when I was talking to those kids about the belt system, like, I wasn't being very black and white. I was. We were just talking as a deeper, wider spectrum on everything. And the fact that they were getting it was just so cool. Mm-hmm. Like, I wasn't talking to a five-year-old. And, like, we always say when you're teaching jujitsu, teach it to a five, teach it like you're teaching it to a five-year-old. Like, you want to explain everything. Mm-hmm. And just the fact that they were understanding the deeper meaning of jujitsu without, like, me spelling it out for them. I don't know. It was just really cool. It was a really cool moment for me. Yes. Yeah. They're great kids. How long have they been training? Marco? Longer than you? No. no. Marco's been training for about... How long have you been training? I've been training for four. Okay. It was actually... It's four years in April. Oh. Mm -hmm. Exciting. But Marco started after I did, so definitely less than four, but I think he's around three. Yeah. And Alex has been training since he was little. Yeah. Like, probably six or seven years old. Yeah, so probably at least five years. Mm -hmm. Five or six years Mm -hmm. for Marco. Right, Alex. Yeah. They're going to be so good. (laughs) Yeah. He is super good. When Alex wraps his little wiry arm around my neck, though, like, oh, yep. that hurts. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. Have you ever had that kind of conversation with the kids before? When we do, 
Because with those two specifically, Alex and Marco, we do a lot of private lessons specifically to help them with jujitsu competitions and pancreation fights and MMA fights. And I do have a lot more conceptual instruction with them than I would with any child. You know, there's a lot of techniques that we break it down, but I also help them understand why they're doing these techniques and what the goal is for each of these situations that I'm putting them through. Mm-hmm. And I make them do it over and over so they build that muscle memory so they can get better at jujitsu about more than just that specific technique I might be showing them. So I do treat them as adults when we have those private lessons. But sometimes they are, they just act up like kids <laughs> and they want to do kid stuff and just like, you know, stand there and bang at each other or not pay attention or they're not focused. So it is it is difficult for me to have those deeper conversations, especially because those lessons we normally have are shorter lessons. Because mm-hmm. if you talk to a child for an hour mm-hmm. straight, they don't have the attention span for that, mm-hmm. just in general. Yeah, that makes sense. But conceptually, yes. As far as outside of that, we do. I do try to tell them about being good training partners, being good friends, and how this can make them stronger outside of jujitsu instead of just the techniques for a specific event. We try to work on better, being better people just a little bit because that's also one of my other jobs is being a life coach. So I kind of add that in there sometimes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I think Marco needs to lose. <laughs> we need to get Marco a match that he, he just did. gets. He lost at Fuji. Did he? Yeah. I don't even remember that. Was yeah. he demolished though? Um, I mean, he lost by points. So no. I mean, it was against a girl. <laughs> he was, he was like, I think he got like bronze or something. Yes. Okay. I do remember that. Yep. And he was very upset. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cause then this little cocky ass kid, after he wins in the cage, he's like already raising his own hand and hitting his chest with his other. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm number one. <laughs> <laughs> And all of us were like, put your hand down. Yeah, I was in the cage. He was waiting to get his hand raised, but his other hand was already in the air. And I was like, Marco, put your hand down. And he was just like, and I was like, whatever. <laughs> we'll talk about this later. So we had to go over that a little bit at dinner, too, about the ego. Yeah. <laughs> Being a little bit humble. Yeah. <clears throat> but. I can get you in anyone. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that's what he lost with that Fuji, too. He went for a guillotine, yeah. and he couldn't actually finish it because he finish it was it. good to get out of it. Yeah, and then the person passed his guard and won by points, mm-hmm. and he was just on the bottom tired because he fell into a guillotine, and he's like, oh, shit. Yep. That didn't work this time. That's right. Mm-hmm. So. But, yeah, how do you feel about the journey of jiu-jitsu? How do you feel about your belt, and what might be upcoming with your three-stripe blue belt is going to be changing sometime soon. Not Sooner than soon. rather than later. Not soon. Yeah. You you are more towards the end of your blue belt than you are towards the beginning of your blue belt. I don't know. I was real pissed when I got that third strike. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So there's some sort of feeling there with the belt for some reason. Let's let's discuss. I think. <laughs> I she rolled her like... eyes. If you can't see this. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of expectation with getting a new belt, no matter what it is. Like, I feel like when you first get whatever color you're next to getting, whether you're an adult or a kid, people just expect more out of you. Like, you should know more technique and you should be able to submit the people below you no matter what. And you should be able to explain something to anyone when they ask you. Because basically, any white belt who sees a blue belt or higher, they just expect that. They they are a god. Yeah, that color belt can now tell you anything. Anything they say is right. And let me tell you, when I got my blue belt and white belts were asking me questions, I'm like, I don't know if that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is what I do. Yep. I'm like, "Hmm, hmm, good luck. (laughs) (laughs) What do you do when they do this? That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, there's definitely days that I roll with purple belts and I'm like, okay, I could like maybe see me at this level soon. And then there's days that I roll purple belts and I'm like, I am nowhere near that. I should not be anywhere close to that. Mm. But see, 
that's where I think that the ranking system is good for showing progression and for putting people in divisions with each other. Mm -hmm. But the ranking system, there's no like standard format for this is what a purple belt should be. This is what a blue belt should be. This is what a brown belt should be. Mm -hmm. And then at black belt, it's the, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the, the valley of knowledge is so large at black belt. There's some black belts that are like, yeah, they're good. They're good at jiu-jitsu. And then there's some black belts that are literally wizards <laughs> that are like nearly untouchable. Mm -hmm. And the gap there is so massive. From each end of like low tier black belt to S tier black belt. Mm -hmm. And there is a bit of that at every belt. And I think that's, you know, the hardest part of getting through jujitsu is first starting, then getting through your belt colors. And then as a black belt, I feel like people have the most imposter syndrome because you compare yourself to all the other black belts. And for some reason, I mean, and then. You know, there's no reason to compare yourself unless you're actually competing at an event. Mm -hmm. And then even then, it's just who performed better on that day. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of people, and this is, like, generalizing and maybe stereotyping if you want to put it that way, but, like, a lot of people, when they get their blue belt, they then think that no white belt should ever be able to tap them out. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> there's a white belt at our gym. Shout out Michael Ware. He taps me out every time we roll. So, like... It's not going to get better just because you change the color. I've been tapped out by multiple white belts this year. <laughs> yeah. I'm a like, purple belt. It happens. Like, just because they're a white belt and you're a colored belt doesn't mean that you're a god. Even right. though the brand new white belts think you are. <laughs> yes. So, I guess that's kind of like where my head's at with it. Is like, yeah, I am a little closer to purple than I was to the newer blue. But, like, at the same time, like... I feel like I'm, again, I think I've said this multiple times. I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I am losing in competition, but I'm still winning in competition. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing really good at open mats, and I'm doing really bad at open mats. Like, I feel like everything is just kind of an ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. And as long as you don't let those um, the lows that you have, like the days that you just feel like you're rolling like shit, or that you just feel like you're not on it, like, as long as you don't let those days kind of, like, determine the rest of your jujitsu, you'll be fine. Yes. And I think you said it perfectly. You are where you're supposed to be. And that's a phrase that you can use for your entire life. You are where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, like, the view you have on your own belt and the view you have on other people's belts, it's through your own lens and your own perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you to decide if it even matters what rank you have. Yeah. And, I and mean, personally, I don't think it does matter, only at a competition setting. And even then, like, it's really, really hard to standardize the belt ranking system. And, you know, IBJJF has tried to standardize the belt ranking system. And they get criticized all over the place for it because then there's certain requirements for how long you can stay at a belt or how long it you have to stay there before you can proceed to the next division. And... I understand why they tried to make that, mm -hmm. but then you still got people that are just crushing it at purple belt. They should be in the brown belt di divisions, but they just can't because the organization's not letting them move on to that. Are you talking about yourself? No, <laughs> I'm not because I have not crushed it at a purple belt IBJJF event yet, mm. but it just happens that way. Like Colabate mm -hmm. is a good example. He just hands is going on right now in Florida. And this is his first brown belt pants. And he was crushing all the purple belt divisions. This is his first brown belt pants. He won gold. Wow. So should he be a black belt now? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, IBJJF wouldn't let him, even if he wanted to. Yeah. Because he just got his brown belt. So, Sorry, I know that... I'm kind of dovetailing everywhere today. No, you're fine. <laughs> it's just, I know that you and I kind of taking three steps back to where we were talking about what we were talking about mm -hmm. is you and I have both been told by multiple people, you especially that we're underranked and we roll like the next belt 
Like, I remember we were just at White Lotus a couple of weeks ago, and we were rolling with a guy who was from out of town. It was Nogi. He didn't know what our ranks were. I was wearing a blue rash guard, so that was fun. <laughs> but he found out that I was a blue belt, and he was like, there's no way you're a blue belt. He's like, you roll like a purple belt. And he was like, and your husband, he rolls like a brown belt. And I was just like, thank you. Like, <laughs> I don't know what else to say to that. But, I mean, I know I've been told a few times that I roll like a purple belt. And I know you've been told lots of times that you roll, roll like a brown belt or even a black belt to some people. And I don't really know what that means. Right. I'm really, I'm, I've been trying to figure like that who, out. Like, who are they to bestow belt ranks on us? Mm-hmm. Not saying anything bad against that person. No, 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 no. Right, not at right. all. He was a super fun role. Right. I don't even remember his name. But. You don't know what he was. name. But, yeah, it's just like. You said there really is no, like, rule book of what you're supposed to be. There's at no age standardized. Now. Yeah. And I think it just comes down to how much time you put in and what techniques you know versus the person you're going against. Because just because you may be a superstar in one technique doesn't mean that you're a superstar in their technique. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm really good at arm bars. I know I'm really good at arm bars. But can she go go potty you? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, like, Nick is, he freezes up when his toes get touched. So, <laughs> for what? toe holds. You, no, I like don't. Toe hold. you said they're, like, your enemy. They are a weakness of mine, but I don't <laughs> freeze. That's a stretch. <laughs> and I'm getting better. <laughs> God. But, yeah, there is no, like, rule book saying exactly what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be. And there may be rules to your professor and where you train and what they're looking for right. for certain stripes or certain belt levels or just anything. Like, your your school might be specific, but generalization, comparing yourself to the world, compar- comparing yourself to IBJJF players, it's just not fair to yourself mm-hmm. because you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one strength of Nogi also, is that, like, when you roll with somebody, whether you're wearing gi or not a no gi, yes gi or no gi, you can tell. Like, mm-hmm. if this were a full on competition match, who would win that roll for the most mm-hmm. time? And then there's some times where it's pretty even, it could go either way, and you can tell that when you're rolling with people. And that's something that's real good about no gi competition, because after you get out of the beginner and out of the intermediate, it's just everybody's in the same pool. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think, a little bit better competition-wise for that reason, mm-hmm. if we're looking at it through that lens. Because once you're once you're good at jujitsu, and you're an advanced level, you can get you get to go up against everybody else that's advanced. But in the gi, you've got a lot more hurdles to get through before you're able to compete at those higher levels. And the rule sets change with every skill division. And in no gi, the rule sets advance faster than they do in the gi. And you can have, like, blue belts in the advanced no gi division just working with the advanced skills that they have in certain areas. Maybe they aren't the best leg lockers, as an example, but they've got fantastic passing and pressure, and people can't do shit about it anyways. So who is to say that they don't deserve winning because they don't know everything about jujitsu? Mm-hmm. Right. And who's to say that they don't deserve whatever rank they have, or they should be a different rank because they've done well in certain rule sets. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to think about the cloth around your waist. Right. I know that I was just talking to one of the blue belts at Fluid, and he was asking me, he just said, when you go train at other gyms, do you normally find yourself being able to submit everyone? Like, the people you roll with, do you, are you able to submit them pretty easily? And I was like, I wouldn't say easy, but yeah, I can find submissions depending on who I'm rolling with. And he had said, he's like, see, I don't have that. And he's a blue belt and I'm a blue belt. And I could kind of tell that he was, like, in a way comparing himself. And I was just like, why are you doing that? Like, what does mm-hmm. what does it matter? And he was just saying something along the lines of, like, he doesn't feel like he's where he should be I guess like maybe he felt like he should still be a white belt or maybe he felt like just he had a lot more to learn as his position I don't really know exactly where his mindset was going but the way he was asking the question it seemed like 
he was comparing himself to other blue belts and maybe not being able to submit people the way that he wanted to. Mm-hmm. And so my advice to him... Funny. <laughs> Jiu-jitsu. <laughs> my advice to him was just uh, to find a position that you really enjoy being and get there all the time. Get there anywhere yes. and get really good at one thing because I know he has one submission from Bottom Turtle that he's really, really, really good at because he's caught me in it quite a few times. And I actually don't put my hand there anymore because I know he's going to do it. But that's just a spot that he's really good. And he's like, oh, yeah, I know I can catch people there. And I'm like, see, so get better at it. I'm like, <laughs> just get good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if you know you're already good there, perfect it. Get the best there. Be the best person at the gym in that spot. Yeah. And then grow from there. And then my dad was in that conversation too. And my dad started saying like, it's like a branch. Like you find your one spot that you're good and then you just keep evolving off of it. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that helps him and his mindset a little bit. That's what I did uh, with loop chokes at that beginning blue belt level. Mm -hmm. Like end of white belt, beginning of blue belt. I was just like a loop choke fanatic. Mm -hmm. Every role is just take the back loop choke, take the back loop choke. (laughs) Every competition, take the back loop choke. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, I still do that sometimes. But, but you branched off of it. Yeah. And now you do mounted triangles <laughs> instead of loop chokes. You need rear triangles? Don't you do mounted too? Well, yeah. I do both. Yeah. Well, you started with mounted triangles and then you changed them to rear triangles and then you still like to do loop chokes every once in a while with the mounted triangle and you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> what now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. You know, on the flip side of cloths it's really hard as an instructor to develop your standards on how you want to promote people Mm -hmm. so i admire all of you coaches out there who are promoting people and making those tough decisions thank you for that Mm -hmm. it's not easy Mm -hmm. especially with all the different body types and i mean yeah and then keeping your own standards somehow with all the different types of people doing jujitsu yeah it's tough and everyone starts as a white belt which makes sense, but like at the same time, if you get actually, D- I was born a blue belt. If you get a D one wrestler, in see how she just ignored me because you keep it. Hmm. <laughs> because uh, if you get a D one wrestler in your gym on the same day as an overweight individual who's never once done anything, any sort of physical activity in their life, like no working out, no martial art or anything, they're both starting with day one white belts. But the D one wrestler is clearly going to have a little bit more of an upper hand just because of the background that they've had. Or somebody that came up through judo. Yeah. Or maybe somebody that just has really good body awareness because they were a gymnast or a break dancer. Right. So it's really hard to determine who gets promoted, especially if you do it just on time. Because if you're going to do it just on time, you're now going to give those two people a strike on the same day in however many months you want to give a strike out. Whether it's three months, six months, a year. Three weeks. Yeah. If you're a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like you just have to make those tough decisions of where you would like your one stripe white belts to be where you would like your one stripe blue belts to be where you would like your four stripe purple belts to be like you have to constantly be thinking about that and you have to take into consideration all the factors of that person rather than just keeping it general which seems really difficult yeah so shout out to all the coaches out there making those tough decisions and promoting people yeah and giving us discussions to talk about on if they deserve that belt or not. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that if you're at a gym that you trust your coach, you trust your training partners, and you're having a good time, you know, the rank is not that big of a deal unless your goal is to be a world-class competitor and you're trying to, I don't know, win all the best tournaments at every belt rank. But, like, that's a tough call, so... You're going to have a tough time no matter where you are trying to do that. Right. But it's more than just about the cloth around your waist. Something like that. So thanks, Marco, for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you credit to that when you're a 25-year-old black belt killing it. Yeah. We'll show you this podcast. Yeah, right. This podcast yeah. is sponsored by Marco Panic. <laughs> when we were weighing in, because his name, his first name is Marco, their last name is Panic, and... The guy that was um, checking his weight, he was like, is your nickname I Will Not? And then Marco was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, did it, Marco? I will not panic. And he was like, oh. And I was like, good one, man. It's about cloth around your waist, but not that. 
<laughs> things to work. Things to work on. So, uh, I guess. All right. I think that about does it for us today. So mm-hmm. sorry it's been so long. We'll try to get back on a normal schedule now that life has calmed down a little bit. But we'll see. Yeah. When the time is right, we're exactly where we need to be when we need to be. Yeah, we don't get paid for this, so. <laughs> we do this just for fun. So, all right, we'll talk to you guys later. Have a good right. week of training. Have a great day.